So this is going to be an introduction to the book of Isaiah, and we're going to make our way through chapter 1. So in the book of Isaiah, you know, quick introduction here. Um, the book was written by the prophet Isaiah over a course of his entire ministry in Judah, which is going to be a focal point. As we go through the book of Isaiah, we're going to talk a whole lot about Judah. We're going to talk a whole lot about the king in Judah at that time. We're going to talk about the king that was in Assyria during this time. And we're going to talk about the king that was in Israel during this time. And basically what we have is we have Isaiah pleading with the people. And basically he's trying to get the message across to them to repent, to get back on that right track once again in God's favor. So another thing we're going to learn is that it was a time of political and moral crisis for this land of Palestine. And it marked the end of that northern kingdom of Israel. And like I said just a minute ago, a rise of the Assyrians as an empire. They're the new powerhouse on the scene. The Assyrians are wanting to conquer as much territory as they possibly can. Uh, similar to what we studied in the book of Daniel as far as the Babylonians being that world power. Well, here we are, we're taking a step backwards in time and now we're going to look at the Assyrians trying to be that world power. So during these events, the southern kingdom Judah had lots of difficulty in basically trying to remain neutral among all this hostility that was going on in the world around them. Uh, we will eventually get into, in chapter 7, we'll, we'll get into some alliances that the northern kingdom was trying to make an alliance with Ahaz down in Judah. They were going to form an alliance to go up against Assyria because they were all scared. And we'll also get into a little later on in further chapters of Judah being tempted with alliances of other nations. And we'll ultimately see that God did not favor these alliances. Uh, it showed a weakness of their faith. It showed a lack of faith that God could protect them. And they were trying to take matters into their own hand. So basically there was eight kings ruling over Israel during the century that we're going to be studying. And there was a total of five kings that were ruled over in Judah. And we'll also be talking about Assyria, in which we'll go over the span of about eight kings that were ruling over those folks at that time also. So a quick look at the map. As you can see, the Assyrians were definitely conquering a lot of territory here. You'll see that up at the top, they originated in this purplish area. And then over time, they started expanding. They expanded all the way down into Babylon. They expanded all the way down the coast here throughout Israel. And then down here into Judah. And then when we get into chapters 20 and uh, 21, we'll see that they actually expanded down into Egypt. And even further down into Ethiopia. So the Assyrians were definitely a powerhouse, and they had that mentality that nobody's going to stand up against them. And you'll notice on the map, we've got some pretty key players here. We've got Tiglath uh, Pileser um, up at the top there mentioned in 745 B.C. And then we've got Sargon II, which we'll discuss when we get into chapter 20 and 21. Uh, when he came into reign, he took on even more territory. And then we have Sennacherib, 
which came on after the scene of Sargon, and he starts taking on more territory as he goes south into Egypt and Ethiopia. So as you can see, this is definitely a powerhouse um, that was taking over as much territory as they can. So what I have here is a list of kings during the period of Isaiah's prophecies. So in Israel, um, I have a list of kings here that are mentioned. And one of the kings that we'll definitely get into discussing a whole lot of is going to be Pekah, uh, which we'll get into talking about later on in, in chapter 7. And he was going to be one of the kings that was trying to make an alliance or force an alliance with Ahaz so that they could together battle against Assyria. So in Assyria, we've got a list of kings here. And like I said just a minute ago, key players, Tiglath Pileser III, uh, Sargon II, and Sennacherib, uh, in which we will read about these individuals. These were strong, powerful kings of Assyria. These were strong leaders, commanders, military type mentality. And again, their focus was to take as much territory as they could. The more territory meant the stronger they would become to the world. And that's definitely what they tried to do. Judah also had kings during this time period. And we will read here shortly about Isaiah, which also went by the name of Azariah. We'll read about Jotham, Ahaz. We'll read a whole lot about Ahaz. Ahaz is mentioned quite often through the book of Isaiah. Isaiah had one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with Ahaz. Um, we're going to talk about Hezekiah. And before we go into the chapters, actually I would like us to just get a glimpse at each of these individuals and some events that went on in their lives. Because in the very first verse... It actually mentions them. It says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, uh, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So one of the things you're going to notice is, as we go through this book is that the focus is going to be with Judah and Isaiah basically pleading them to repent, turn away from their sins, get back in good standings with God. And we're going to see numerous, numerous examples of Isaiah pleading with the people. So these four kings ruling during Judah's, uh, ruling over Judah during this time span is going to be from about 767 B.C. all the way into 686 B.C. So why don't we look at some examples of these folks out of the Bible. So the first one that we came into contact with in verse 1 was Isaiah. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 26... It says, Then all the people of Judah took Isaiah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah, and that king, and after that the king slept with his fathers. Sixteen years old was Isaiah when he began to reign. So he was a very young man. And he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name uh, also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. So right off the bat, we're learning that Uzziah was a very young man when he came into this kind of authority. He, he was thrown into this. He was making some pretty major decisions. In 2 Kings 15, it says, In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam king of Israel began Azariah. 
son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. So Azariah, Uzziah, it's two different names. We're talking about the same person here. It says in verse 2, 16 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And in verse 3 it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. So in Second Chronicles 26 and verse 5 we have it recorded, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding and the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. So, Uzziah, through the several victories that he experienced against his neighboring foes, his heart became proud. So we just read how he sought to do that which was right. He was a young man. So he was doing things right to begin with. And then we're going to see that over time, his heart became proud. Just like a lot of people today, you can become, you can start off good. You're starting off on the right foot, but maybe there's some events in your life that's going to turn you to be more proud. Maybe you had some accomplishments that you started to get the big head, that you were unstoppable, and you started to become proud. You were no longer humble. So he entered into the temple to offer incense, which was the exclusive duty of the priests. And for this, offen for this offense, uh, he was struck with leprosy for the remainder of his life. So, just curious, does anyone know why this would have been such, such a bad thing for him to have done? To have entered into the temple to offer that incense. Yeah, he was not qualified. Um, God had rules for specific people, and this uh, specific responsibility was something that the priests were going to do, not him. But he took it upon himself to go in and do it himself. So, let's see here. I've got read. Second Chronicles 26, 16 through 21. I've got it on the screen. It says, But when he was strong, in other words, he was, he was on top of the world. He was doing his best. It says, His heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. He went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And it says, And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests and the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. They were trying to tell him, What are you doing? Get out of here. You know better than this. We're the ones. The priests are the ones who are supposed to do this. Not you. You need to leave. In verse 19, then Isaiah was wroth. He became angry and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up to his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence, yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. 
And Isaiah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, dwelt in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And then Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Started off on the right foot, ended up getting the big head, ended up thinking he could do anything he wanted. He became proud. And basically God shut that down and showed Isaiah that he, he was not the one who had all the power. He was not the one who was making up the rules. Isaiah was supposed to have been following God's rules and not making up his own. <clears throat> so another person that we just saw come on the scene is Jotham. Jotham was the son of Isaiah, Isaiah served as a co-regent during the years of Isaiah's leprosy. In other words, Isaiah would have been too sick to really be doing the full job so you had his son Jotham who's stepping in and they're kind of ruling this thing together. Uh, and when his father died, Jotham became the sole ruler. So in 2 Kings 15, starting in verse 34, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he did according all that his father Isaiah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places, and he built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. So Jotham failed to take away the high places, which uh, was where people made sacrifices and burned their incense to idols. And according to Isaiah's prophecies, Judah would be judged for this very thing. And that was gonna, that's going to be one of the biggest things for Judah, is the idols. Uh, we're going to talk a little later on about how Judah looked around at the other nations. You know, these were a simple people. These were farming folks. They were going to look around at the other nations, this, these societies, these sophisticated societies with the fancy images, and, and they were going to fall trapped to all that. And here we have Jotham failing to uphold his responsibility and to take away these high places. So in 2 Kings 15.38, it says, And Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father, and Ahaz his son reigned in his stead. So here we have Ahaz coming on the scene. Ahaz is going to be a huge player as we begin our studies in Isaiah. So when we're looking at Ahaz, some background, Ahaz became king of Judah at the death of his father Jotham, and he chose not to follow his father's footsteps. Ahaz was not godly. In 2 Kings 16.2, it says 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God like David his father. So 2 Kings 16.10-16, I don't think I have that up here. So we'll... We'll go ahead and turn there real quick. Uh, would anyone want to read 2 Kings 16, 10, 10 through 16? Okay. And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet with Hosea, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz said to, sent to Arisha, the priest the fashion of the altar and the pattern pattern of it, according to all the workmanship thereof. And there, Uriah the priest, the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from the master. So Uriah the priest made it against King Ahaz, made it against King Ahaz came from the master. And when the king was 
come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached to the altar and offered their own. And he burned his burnt offerings and his meat offerings, and poured his drink offerings, and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord, from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar. And King Ahaz commanded Elijah, the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burned the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering, and the king's burnt sacrifice and his meat offering, with the burnt offering from of all the people of the land, and their meat offering and their drink offerings, and sprinkled upon it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice, and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire about. Thus did Elijah the priest according to all the king Ahaz commanded. Okay, so after reading those verses, what what was the one thing that really stood out that Ahaz did that was completely wrong? What did he do? And it really goes right down the path of what the whole nation ends up doing when they start seeing these heathen nations and they start trying to bring in these things. That's right. So he saw this altar, the Syrian altar, and basically he had it copied and built in the temple, which was completely against the law of Moses. So Ahaz is definitely leading the people down that path towards idolatry, towards being just like those other nations. And it's really no different than today with the church. It wasn't too long ago Clark did a lesson on musical instruments and how at one point in history uh, the church decided, some of the church members decided they wanted to bring in these musical instruments. And there's a big split and they went off and they started their own denomination which I believe is the Christian church. So in the church today we, we still have this problem of people trying to bring in these things of the world trying to justify it in their minds when really at the end of the day it's contrary to the law that we're supposed to be abiding. And God's not going to be happy with that. Just like Ahaz brought in this altar. God's not happy with that. God didn't want that to happen. Um, let's see here. Okay, so then the next one in verse 1 in Isaiah was Hezekiah. And again, we're going to touch on these a little more in depth later on in the book. But these are just the highlights. So Hezekiah, again, a co-regent with his father Ahaz. For 13 and 42 years he reigned. And this is going to be around the time period of 729 to 686 B.C. And we have it mentioned in 2 Kings chapters 18 through 20. And we have it mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapters 29 through 32. And basically all of this is laying out some events for the life of Hezekiah. So we're not going to read all these chapters, but I will bring up a few highlights here. 2 Kings 18 says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old, was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, or Abby, Abi, and the daughter, she was the daughter of Zechariah. So Hezekiah is known as the reform king. In other words, Hezekiah came on the scene all of what his past fathers have done 
Hezekiah tried to reserve all that his father Ahaz had done. And let's see here, some highlights here to get a better idea of what I'm even talking about. Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, it says, uh, starting in verse 3, it says, He in his first year of his reign in the first month, it says, Hezekiah opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. And he said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves. Sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. And then in chapter 29, starting in verse 20, of Second Chronicles it says, Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven he goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests and the sons of Aaron to offer them on the altar of the Lord. And in verse 22, so they killed the bullocks, bullocks, and the priests received the blood, sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, uh, when they had killed the rams, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they brought forth the he goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. And in verse 24 it says, And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. So Hezekiah restored worship of the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles 29, 28, it's stated, And all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So, which brings us now to the actual, actual message of Isaiah as we get into this study. So the message of Isaiah... You know, Isaiah warned Israel of the sin of idolatry and the sin of rebellion against God. We're going to learn that as we go through the verses. Isaiah told them that God's judgment would come upon evildoers. Isaiah consoled Israel by prophesying of the coming Messiah, which we're going to see that firsthand in chapter 2. And... Who, who would bring the redemption and salvation not just to Israel but to all nations. So Isaiah is bringing this message to the people, this message of hope, this message that they need to repent and live right in God's sight. And I've got on there that the salvation would not just be for Israel but for all nations. And that's exactly the message that Isaiah is putting forth in Isaiah chapter 2, is that this would be something that would be offered to all men everywhere. All nations would gather to hear the teaching that would be done. And that should give hope not only to Israel and Judah, but actually should give hope for all the different nations in the world that there was something to come in the future. So, let's see, 1034. <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's keep going, and we'll just see how far we get into chapter 1 here. So, to start off, we have part 1. Uh, 
of this book of Isaiah, which is going to consist of chapters 1 through 12. So in chapters 1 through 12, we're going to have prophecies against Judah. So we're going to see a lot of communication going on here with Ahaz concerning the people in Judah. And we're going to go through, like I said, the first 12 chapters that are going to be talking about this. So just so we can all get an idea of the locations here of the different kingdoms, uh, there at the top you see we've got the kingdom of Israel, which is in blue, and then right below that is the kingdom of Ju Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Israel's the northern kingdom, Judah's the southern kingdom. And when you look at this map, is there anything special as far as maybe a pretty popular, well-known city that will be located in Judah? Jerusalem. And in case you couldn't find it on the map, I've got a big arrow and a circle. So Jerusalem is a key city. Jerusalem is going to be a key city throughout the Old Testament studies all the way into the New Testament studies. Jerusalem is going to be mentioned. So we'll dive into that the further we get into uh, the book of Isaiah. But this is basically a map of all the different um, kingdoms and tribes where the lands were split up. But specifically, we're going to be talking about Judah. So chapter 1 is going to be a judgment on a rebellious people. And that's exactly what's happening here with the nation of Judah. And the very first verse, we have the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And all of these men were kings of Judah. So we have a vision. So special revelation came to Isaiah from God concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So in this very verse, we have the subjects that's going to be talked about Judah and Jerusalem, and this is a message coming from Isaiah. And it says this was happening in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah, boy, I tell you what, saying Isaiah and Isaiah over and over again, I'm getting tongue tied here. So this is happening in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And it gives us a chronological data for determining that Isaiah prophesied, when you look up these kings in the history, from about 739 B.C. to 686 B.C. So we've got some time frames here that we can go back. We can look at secular history and what's been recorded by the historians. And all of these dots get connected. And we'll touch on that as we go through the book. So, verse 1, we have Ahaz and we have Hezekiah mentioned. So Ahaz and Hezekiah is going to consume a lot of Isaiah's message. Ahaz, we're going to learn, shows a lack of faith and is open-minded to having ungodly alliances which only invite disaster. So these ungodly alliances are going to be alliances that we're going to dive into later on, such as chapters 20 and 21, where it's talking about Egypt and Ethiopia. God frowns on these alliances. And then Hezekiah, you know, we're going to see that he shows faith, and he makes it possible for God's deliverance and blessing on the people. He tried to make it right. Ahaz was stubborn. He tried to do his own thing. Hezekiah tried to make it right. So, 
the nation prosecuted. So the root of the matter, right off the bat, we have the root of the matter for the people. In verse 2 it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. The root of the matter, the people had lost their knowledge. They've lost their zeal and desire to want, for one, to learn what they need to do. And when they did learn it, they lost their desire to want to follow through with it. They rebelled against God, is what it says. They have deliberately refused to follow the commands of God. They rejected His loving kindness and His salvation. And that is the state of the people during this time frame. And this is why Isaiah has this mission to go in and try to persuade them to repent try to persuade them to realize you're not in good standings with God. What has happened to you folks? So the root of the nation's sin was that they did not know or understand, which is also uh, an issue for today. People just do not know or understand what it is that God expects them to do. Their sin was against the knowledge of God. A few years earlier, God, through the prophet Hosea, actually put out a similar charge against the northern kingdom of Israel. So in Hosea 4.6, the northern kingdom was being told, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget my children. So their northern kingdom, their northern friends, were already being told and warned, you know what, you're going to be judged because you have no knowledge. You rejected knowledge. So they saw this happening to their northern uh, neighbors, and yet they're down here doing the very same thing. And now Isaiah is having to hash out these same things that Hosea was telling the northern kingdom. You rejected knowledge. You have a lack of knowledge. So in Isaiah 1.3 it says, The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. So when you look at this word know, you know, not only knowledge, but know can be connected with respect, love, care, good deeds and services. In other words, Israel, they weren't doing anything they should have been doing. They were living like the world, like the heathen nations. Um, they rejected the knowledge of God. They rejected God's ways. Sin results when we refuse to know God. And I don't have this up here, but we'll turn real quick to Romans chapter 1. And would anyone want to read verses 18 through 32? Okay. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may know may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shewed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to um, like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up in, unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedience to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So in verse 28, and even they, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So here we have Paul talking about the people in this first century having that issue of wanting to retain God in their knowledge. And here we have Isaiah way in the past talking about the people refusing to know God, refusing to retain God in their knowledge. And all these different examples we see, it always leads in a very negative outcome. The outcome is you become, you become separated from God. And the ultimate outcome of being separated from God is you're going to ultimately miss out on your crown of glory, your reward of heaven one day. So this is all very critical for anybody to realize the importance of retaining the knowledge that God has in His Word and applying it to your lives. Throughout all history, God expected the people not to just know it, but to do it, to have action behind it, to follow through with it, to live it. So sin was the cause of exile. In Isaiah chapter 5, when we eventually get there, it says, therefore my people are gone unto cap into captivity. Why? Because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Knowledge was where the people lacked. Their desire to want knowledge is where they lacked. Peter said that Christians are spiritually equipped by their knowledge of Christ. In 2 Peter 1, 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to the glory and virtue. So throughout all of God's Word, knowledge is definitely a key point for us to be able to live faithfully unto God. And I'm just looking at the time here, and I believe we're just going to have to do a maybe a two-part lesson on this chapter 1. And we'll, we'll call it quits for today here, but next week we'll go ahead and finish out chapter 1 and we'll pick up in verse 4. And basically we're going to discuss the accusation that's going to be made uh, to the people. So let's end it here and we'll pick up next week and we'll get the rest of this chapter on video.